Long ago, during my youth and the days of my childhood, which have flashed by and vanished irretrievably, I felt a joyful anticipation on approaching a place for the first time. No matter whether it was a village, a small town, or some suburb, my keen young eye always discovered much that was fascinating there. Every building, so long as it bore some seal of distinctive character, caught my attention and filled me with wonder. It might have been some stone administrative building in the standard style of architecture, half its windows faults sticking up all alone above a cluster of lower middle class, one-story log houses. It might have been a well-rounded cupola covered with white sheet iron, Rising above a new church, whitewashed to shine like snow, it might have been a marketplace or a local dandy chanced upon in the center of a small town. Nothing escaped my fresh, keen eye. And with my nose poked out of the carriage, I would stare at the unfamiliar cut of a coat. At wooden boxes, some containing nails, some holding sulfur, which gleamed yellowish even at a distance, others with raisins or soap all seen in a flash inside a grocer's along with jars of stale candies from Moscow. And then I would watch an infantry officer walking along, swept by destiny from God knows what corner of the country, to the backwoods boredom of the small district center, or a merchant wearing a fur coat, dashing by in a light carriage. And then, in my mind's eye, I would follow all these people into their lonely lives, if some local clerk passed by, I would wonder, where could he be going? To a party? To see some colleague of his? Or simply home to sit for half an hour or so by his door while the twilight turns to thick darkness and then to have an early supper with his mother, his wife, the wife's sister, and the whole family? And what will they be talking about when the servant girl with beads around her neck or a boy servant in a quilted jacket brings in the candle in the old familiar candlestick after the soup has been served. Driving up to the village of some landowner, I would look curiously at a tall, slender wooden belfry or at a squat, dark, old wooden church. From afar, the red roof and the white chimneys of the landowner's house beckoned temptingly to me through the green foliage. And I waited impatiently for the moment when the orchard surrounding it would part and it would be there, full size. Then, unlike today, alas, the sight of it would not strike me as banal. And looking at it, I would try to imagine what the landowner himself was like. Whether he was fat, whether he had sons, or a whole set of six daughters, with their girlish laughter and games. And with the inevitable beauty the youngest sister, whether all the daughters had dark eyes, whether the landowner himself was a fun lover or as gloomy as late fall, and whether, his eyes on the calendar, he would discourse endlessly about rye and wheat, a boring topic for the young. Today, I feel nothing but indifference when I approach an unknown village, and with indifference I gaze at it's commonplace sights to my eyes grown cold. It is uninviting, and I am neither excited nor amused. Things that would have brought a lively expression to my face made me laugh, and set loose torrents of words now glide past me while my motionless lips preserve a detached silence. Oh, my youth! Oh, my freshness! Chichikov, thinking about the epithet the peasant had applied to Plushkin and laughing inwardly at it, had failed to notice that he was now in the middle of a large village with many streets and houses. Soon, however, he became aware of this fact because of the jolting of his carriage on the uneven wooden roadway, compared to which the cobbles in a town are ideally smooth. Like piano keys, the logs of the roadway kept rising and falling, and unless he took the necessary precautions, the traveler could acquire a bruise on his brow or a lump on the back of his head or even perhaps cut off the very tip of his tongue with his own teeth. Chichikov noticed that the buildings were unusually shabby. The logs of the cabins were old and darkened. Many of the roofs were as leaky as sieves. 
and many houses had nothing over them but the ridge pole and the cross beams like so many ribs. It may have been that the occupants of the houses themselves had removed the shingles, reasoning, and quite rightly, that anyway, the huts were no protection when it rained, and when it wasn't raining, what need was there to coddle oneself inside, when there was plenty of space in the tavern, or in the streets, or wherever? The windows in the houses lacked glass, and some were stuffed with rags or sheepskins. The railed balconies, which God knows why, are a part of Russian peasant huts, sagged so badly and were so blackened that they were no longer even picturesque. In places, huge stacks of wheat stretched in rows behind the cottages. It was obvious they had been standing there for a long time, since they were the color of half-baked brick and had all sorts of weeds growing on them and even on one of them, a shrub which had managed to spring up in a corner. The wheat belonged apparently to the landlord. Against the clear sky behind the wheat stacks and the ramshackle roofs of the cottages, two village churches kept appearing, sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right, as the carriage followed the turns in the road. One was wooden and disused, and the other had a yellowish stone wall, which was stained and cracked. Bit by bit, the master's house started to come into view, until suddenly there it was, all of it, in the spot where the chain of cottages broke off and yielded to a wasteland that might once have been a vegetable garden or a cabbage patch and was still enclosed by a dilap dilapidated wooden fence. This strange, disproportionately elongated castle called to mind a crippled old man. In places it was only one story high, in other places too, above its dark roof, which did not everywhere provide protection against the rain, two rickety belvedere's bearing no trace of the paint that once covered them, stuck up facing each other. In spots, the walls of the house revealed the naked lathe, and it was obvious they had been through all sorts of weather, rain, wind, and autumnal storms. Of the windows, only two were used as such, the rest being shuttered or boarded up, and the two active windows had a squint, a triangle of blue paper of the sort used for wrapping sugar, was stuck across one of them. Only the vast garden behind the house, wild and overgrown, stretching out beyond the peasants' huts where it blended into the open fields, provided a bright spot of freshness in this village. It alone was beautiful in its spectacular wildness. The interlacing tops of the trees, growing and spreading unrestrained, lay on the skyline like green clouds and irregular cupolas of quivering leaves. The huge white trunk of a birch that had lost its crest in a thunderstorm rose above this green tangle, looming up in the air like a round column of dazzling marble. Instead of a capital, the sharp, slanting surface where its top had broken off stood out dark against its snowy whiteness, like a hat or a blackbird. A hop vine, smothering the elder and hazel bushes below, ran along the top of a hedge and then twined itself around the broken birch reaching halfway to the top. From there it hung down, grasping at the surrounding treetops or dangling in the air, its fine clinging tendrils swaying gently. Here and there among the sunlit thickets, a gap would open up like a dark mouth, the dark mouth of some monster. Within it, everything was hidden in deep shadow and one could barely make out a narrow path, a broken down railing, a dilapidated arbor, a hollow decaying willow stump a hoary pea tree thrusting out its thick bristles from behind the willow, its intertwined and intermingled leaves and twigs withering in the terribly overcrowded tangle. And finally, a young maple branch stretching out its leafy paws beneath one of which, by some miracle, the sun had managed to penetrate, turning it into something transparent and glowing in the dense darkness. By the very edge of the garden, a few aspens, much taller than the other trees, lifted large crow's nests high up into the air on their quivering tops. Some of these trees had broken branches hanging from them, their withered leaves still attached. In a word, it was wild and somehow beautiful and desolate at the same time. 
a work which not, could not have been contrived by nature or by art alone, but by their combined efforts only, with nature's chisel going over the often senselessly elaborate work of man, relieving the heaviness, obliterating the vulgar symmetry and the crude lapses, which reveal the laboriousness of the planner's efforts, and thus communicating a miraculous warmth to something created in cold, measured, neatness, and precision. After another turn or two, Chichikov found himself in front of the proprietor's house, which looked even gloomier close up. Green mold covered the old wooden fence and the gate, the buildings crowding the yard, servants' quarters, barns, sheds, were obviously in a state of dilapidation. To right and left, there were other gates leading to other yards. Everything indicated that once the place had been quite prosperous. But now it all looked bleak. There was nothing to animate the picture. No door opened. No one moved in or out of the buildings. No hustle and bustle. In fact, no sign of life at all. Only the main gate was open, and that because a peasant had driven in a loaded cart covered with matting. He might have come especially to liven up the picture, if only by that much, for an enormous padlock hanging on the gate indicated that it, too, was usually kept locked. Chichikov soon noticed a figure by one of the sheds who started bickering with the peasant with the cart. For some time he could not make out the creature's sex. It was dressed in something that looked very much like a woman's dressing gown and had a little cap on its head, such as is often worn by housemaids in the country. The voice, however, seemed a bit husky for a woman's. Oh yes, it's a woman, Chichikov thought, and then immediately reversed himself. Oh no! Finally, after he had examined it more closely, he decided, of course, she's a woman. For its part, the figure was closely examining him, too. One might have deduced from this scrutiny that visitors were not a familiar, familiar sight around those parts. For having looked Chichikov over, the figure concentrated on Selifan, and then inspected the horses, starting at their tails and winding up with the tips of their muzzles. Judging by the bunch of keys hanging from a belt and by the abusive language used to tell off the peasant, Chichikov concluded that she must be the housekeeper. <laughs>